Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our morning service this morning and for those who may be watching on the live stream later, uh, welcome as well. Uh, let us worship God this morning then by singing to his praise in the Scottish Psalter in Psalm 23. <clears throat> Psalm 23 on page 229. We shall sing the whole psalm to God's praise. <clears throat> The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, he makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make, within the paths of righteousness, even for his own name's sake, and so on. We shall sing the whole psalm to God's praise. Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me in pastures green. Father in heaven, we come this morning before you to worship your name, uh, thankful 
for the psalm even that we have been singing, such a well-known psalm, and yet how many <coughs> meditate upon the content and the things that are mentioned therein, that you are indeed our shepherd if we believe and trust implicitly in the finished work of Calvary. And we thank you for that, <coughs> that you guide us, you keep us, you uphold us, and you strengthen us day by day that your promise is that we shall not want. And uh, it's hard for us to understand that that is not a material thing, but a spiritual thing. Uh, also hard for us to understand uh, what you say in the course, or what David wrote in the course of that psalm, that you have furnished our table in the presence of so many foes. And yet, O oh Lord, uh, we, have, we are surrounded by foes that are unseen, spiritual foes and spiritual warfare that attacks us day by day. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that you anoint our heads with oil, that our cup is not just full, but it overflows. And we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning with all these blessings and benefits and uh, the privileges that you give us in health and strength, and even the lovely day that you have given this morning. We thank you for so many gathered together to worship you, and we remember uh, others belonging to the congregation who may be away at this time or unable to be present for various reasons. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless them wheresoever they are that you would be a wall of fire around them and a glory in the midst of those who are unable to be present in your house, particularly due to old age or infirmity, and yet their heart is here worshipping with them. And we thank you for them. We thank you for their prayers that uphold your people. And we thank you, O Lord, that this morning we can come to you in prayer, that you are the one who listens to prayer. Uh, and although very often, uh, or perhaps often, the answer is not what we expect, nevertheless, you are pleased to bless us in answering and listening to our prayer. And we thank you even for the simple answers that we get day by day to bring us safely to your house, to take us back, back home in safety again, for the food that you provide for us, uh, and especially for having your word in our own languages, and the freedom to be able to come and listen to it and to read it. Oh, that you would be present in the midst of us this morning, that your spirit would be poured out indeed as we come to meditate upon a portion of your scripture. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather round your word once again. We pray that you would bless uh, our meditations this morning that you would bless this congregation. We pray for the minister and his family, that you would uphold and strengthen him, grant a time of rest and refreshment. And we thank you uh, for all that he does uh, in your service. We pray for all your servants this morning as your word is proclaimed throughout our island and throughout our nation, and indeed to the uttermost ends of the earth, even in different time, time zones. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be present, uh, for you have promised where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are there. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would uh, feel the, your presence this morning, that we would be able to say that it is good for us to be here, to be gathered together in your house. And we thank you, O oh Lord, uh, <coughs> that that is still freely available to us, that we are able to come to worship. <coughs> I remember so many others who could be in your house this morning throughout our island, throughout our villages, and indeed throughout our land, and yet have no thought whatsoever of the things pertaining to the Word of God, no thought of eternity, no thought of this uh, life that will eventually come to an end, but who live from day to day without any, uh, any guidance uh, except for their own vain thoughts. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would pour out your Spirit once again upon us as a nation, and especially as an island, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that we would see streams in the desert and hear the voice of the turtle dove in our land once again. We thank you uh, for the words that we hear in different places. 
that your spirit is moving uh, in different parts of the world. And we pray, O oh Lord, especially for the churches in our denomination this morning that uh, uh, are being uh, included in the prayer rota. We pray for Gardenston and Robin Gray and his ministry there. And we pray for the church in South Uist uh, and Tom Penman and his ministry there and that you would bless these. And we thank you, O oh Lord, also for the work of the free church camps that now come to an end. We pray, O oh Lord, that your blessing would follow. Uh, upon all that was done, the work that was done there, and so many who volunteer and give of their time freely. Bless the children, uh, bless the children present here this morning, that you would uh, teach them uh, in the days of their youth, so that as they grow up, uh, they will remember these things and remember their Creator in the days of their youth before the evil days come. We have no knowledge uh, of what is to come, and yet uh, your word tells us continually that the days indeed are evil, and that we should be redeeming the time. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless us uh, as we meditate upon these things this morning and later in the evening. Uh, guide us, uh, because we need your guidance. We need the presence of your spirit. We need the unction that comes from on high to guide us in your word. Help us, O Lord, to meditate on these things. Be with us now as we continue to do so, to sing your praises. Bless the children uh, and the message to them this morning, and that you would uh, uphold and strengthen the parents who bring them faithfully and who teach them at home, and that these things would bear fruit in the future. Be with us now and bless us and pardon sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> uh, boys and girls, I have a, a little story for you this morning and I could not remember if I'd actually told it here before or not. Uh, if I have and you've heard it already, sorry, if you haven't, <coughs> uh, then perhaps you'll take it away with you and tell it to someone else. And it's a little story that was sent to me by uh, my cousin in, uh, in Buffalo in the United States, where she heard it, uh, her minister told it in the church. And I thought it was a, a very interesting little story. And of course, like all things American, it is set in the United States. And in the United States, as I'm sure you're aware, things are very different to what they are here. And one of the amazing things about the United States is that chickens and pigs can speak to each other. And I don't know if you knew that or not, but chickens and pigs in America, uh, the United States of America, speak to each other on a regular basis. And there was a chicken and a pig walking down the road one morning uh, and they were chatting away, etc. And eventually they were passing a McDonald's. Now there's an American thing that we've grown so fond of, or some of us have. But there was a big sign outside the McDonald's and it said, Ham and eggs for breakfast, special offer, $2.95. And the chicken looked at the sign and he said to the pig, Ha, huh, he said, that's our only contribution to society in this country, breakfast food. Huh, ham and eggs. The pig turned and said to him, he said, for you it might be a contribution. For me, it's total commitment. I have to give my life for the ham. You, it's just a contribution. But you don't make the sacrifice that I do in order to feed all these huge Americans. And so they went on. What does it tell us? Do you, even in your childhood, 
Do you have a sense of total commitment to the Word of God? Or is it just a contribution that you make every Sabbath by coming perhaps here and then Sabbath school? But it's nothing other than that. It's just part of your daily walk like the chickens was. And I'd like you to meditate on that, take the story away with you and think about the total contribution that the pig made. And it should remind you, of course, of the one who has made a total contribution for your salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it cost much more than $2.95. It cost him his life. Total contribution. Perhaps that's what God is calling you to this morning, to think of total con commitment to his word and to his laws. It's what Jesus says to us, if you love me, keep my commandments. So bear that in mind. If you've heard it before, it's good to refresh it again. <coughs> and thank you for listening this morning. <coughs> Let us sing again in Psalm 82. Psalm 82 on page 336. We'll sing the whole psalm. In God's assembly, God does stand. He judges God's among. How long accepting persons vile will you give judgment wrong? <laughs> Defend the poor and fatherless. To poor oppressed do right. The poor and needy ones set free. Rid them of ill men's might. And so on down to the end of the psalm. And pay particular attention to verses 6 and 7 as we sing it. In God's assembly, God stand. In God's assembly, God doth stand. He judgeth God's among. How long accept in God's word then as we find it in the New Testament in the Gospel of John and in chapter 10. The Gospel of John 
and chapter 10. We shall read the whole chapter. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who, had, who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will free from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me of thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? <laughs> at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of, of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even although you do not believe me, believe the works, 
that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that Jesus said about this man was true and many believed in him there. Amen. May the Lord bless to us that reading of his holy and infallible word, and to his name be the praise. Let's sing again then in Psalm 34. Psalm 34 on page 246. Uh, we'll sing the verses marked 1 to 7. God will I bless all times. His praise my mouth shall still express. My soul shall boast in God, the meek shall hear with joyfulness. Extol the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, he heard and did me from all fears deliver. And so on, down to verse, uh, verse 9, 8 and 9. No taste and see that God is good, who trusts in him is blessed. Fear God as saints, none that him fear shall be with want oppressed. Sing these verses into God's praise. Psalm 34 God will I bless all time. God will I bless all times, his praise. My mouth shall still express. My soul shall boast in God. The shall hear with joyfulness. Extol the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, he heard and did me from all fears deliver. They look to him and lightened where no shame it where their faces. This poor man cried, God her and save him from Distresses. The angel of the Lord encamps and round encompasses all those about that do him fear and them deliver. and see that God is good who trusts in him is blessed fear God his saints none that him fear shall be with one to Turn back then to the uh, chapter that we read, and we can read again at verse uh, 22, just a bit of this passage here. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And especially that verse, verse 30, I and the Father are one. And basically that is the answer that Jesus gives to the question that the Jews uh, ask him. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. I and the Father are one. The Gospel of John, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, is uh, a Gospel that is written later, much later, than the other three Gospels, just to introduce it to you a little bit. And the whole purpose of the Gospel of John is quite different to the other three Gospels. Uh, we tend to refer to the other three Gospels as the synoptic Gospels. Each one has a particular audience. Matthew is writing to the Jews, Mark uh, to the Gentiles, uh, sorry, Mark to uh, various other groups, and Luke to the Gentiles. But John's purpose is quite different. They're called the synoptic Gospels because they give a synopsis of oh. Jesus' life, that is, a summary, that's what a synopsis means. But that is not John's purpose at all. By the time John writes his gospel, and uh, many commentators think, and historians think, that it was written when he was in exile in Patmos, uh, along with the revelation that he was given, although we have no information to justify that, but uh, that's the view that many hold, but by the time John comes to write his gospel, the three other gospels are in circulation and quite well known among the Christian church. But what has happened during that period of time is that a school of thought known later as Gnosticism has sprung up in which the divinity of Jesus Christ is not only questioned, but actually denied. And John writes his gospel. You, you'll notice if you read John's gospel that it omits many of the details. We know nothing from John's gospel about the birth of Jesus, etc., and so on. Uh, but many other things are included that are not in the other three gospels. For example, in the following chapter, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead only appears in John. And the discourse on the sheep here uh, that we have only appears here as well. And John is writing his gospel to prove the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Some of the younger ones might be struggling a little bit with the idea of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, it means to prove that God, in sending Jesus Christ, is sending a God-man. I and my Father are one. Now, that's a very difficult concept for us, perhaps, to understand. And it's no wonder that the Jews pick up stones in order to stone him. Because Jesus is, in fact, according to the Jews, breaking the law. And he's breaking the law from the book of Deuteronomy. That's why they accuse him of blasphemy. It's in Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 16 that uh, the principle of blasphemy is, outside, is laid out here. And that is anyone who denies the divinity of God. God. And therefore Jesus quotes to them the passage that we sang in the psalm that we sang. And you see, it is, is it in verse 34, is it not written in your law, I said you are God, so he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent to the, into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? But of course, <coughs> it is a very difficult concept to understand. 
And I want to perhaps explore this in greater detail this morning, the concept of the divinity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I and the Father are one. Now, the first thing, <coughs> being expert linguists that most of you will be, you should notice that it appears that grammatically that sentence is incorrect. I and the Father are one. You would expect it to say, I and the Father is one, because if it's one, one is singular. But it's are one. And it points immediately to a plurality of persons. This is not new in Scripture. It's there from the very beginning of the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Genesis. What do you find? When man is created, it is let us make man in our image. Not me in my image, but in our image. And therefore, <clears throat> the persons, the concept that we call the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is present from the very beginning of Scripture. Now, I'm not going to go into the Trinity in great detail. That's not my purpose today. But to examine more, how can Jesus... And the Father be one. Theologians refer to it as the hypostatic union. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. If you haven't, it doesn't really matter. You can forget it immediately. It's just a theological term that's used for the concept. Because there is no other concept like it. And this is why it was so difficult for the Jews to understand it. And it is, of course, equally difficult for us to understand it as well. There are some religions, <coughs> among them the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, who deny completely the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the concept that most people have nowadays of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is simply a prophet, a good teacher, an excellent example, one who taught many things that are good and who went around healing and doing things that were good. But when it comes to accepting that the Lord Jesus Christ is both God and man, two natures in one person, then people have immense difficulty with that concept. And maybe you're struggling with it yourself this morning. Maybe it's one of the questions that you have in your mind. How can Jesus be both God and man at the same time? Now, don't be surprised if you're struggling with that question. It's not a question that is easily answered. And it's a question that bothered theologians right from the earliest times in the church. If you go back to the fourth century, you find that immense debates were taking place in the church even then about the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. This concept of the God-man. And it was up to a 4th century bishop, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, a chap called Athanasius, some of you may have come across him, who was the bishop at the time of Alexandria in Egypt. Now that was one of the two centers of Christianity uh, in the world at that particular time. Uh, it's interesting that later on, of course, uh, Christianity is eliminated from Alexandria completely. And uh, the main center moves from Antioch to Rome. <clears throat> but Ath Athanasius defended this concept, and he wrote what is called the Athanasian Creed. 
<clears throat> now, it's quite long uh, to give you an idea of what's in it. You can find it online, and I'm not going to read all of it to you because uh, that would be uh, to spend a lot of time reading. But I want to read the last part of it to you. And this is what he says. He says, Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that the believer also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's his birth, the incarnation. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the world, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world. Perfect God and perfect man. Of a rational soul, and human flesh subsisting. Equal to the Father, as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father, as touching his manhood. Who, although he is God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. Come back to that later. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into Hades, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven, he sits on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the quick and the dead, and so on. Now, if, that, if, if it was necessary to lay that out so clearly in the fourth century, it's little wonder that from then on, the church and many within the church, and the church worldwide here, have had great difficulty with the concept of Jesus and God being one person. And that was why in the 16th century the reformers when they wrote the Westminster Confession later thought it necessary that this be put in the catechism. Uh, it's gone out of fashion now unfortunately hasn't it the shorter catechism. I don't know do, you, do they do it in Sunday school here at all? Yeah they do it. Good. Used to be taught in the day school as well, and I can remember uh, as a young person having to uh, memorize the whole catechism. And then you were asked questions of it in Sunday school and in the day school. And if you got them all right and you could repeat the whole catechism, you got a prize. But what's the use of the catechism? Well, it puts not in simple words because many of the things that we learnt in the catechism when we were learning them and a clue what they meant, but we remembered them. It puts in a simpler form, if I can put it that way, the questions and the points that we're debating. And if you go to question six in the shorter catechism, it says, how many persons are there in the Godhead? I'm sure some of you will know the answer immediately to that. There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are one God, one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Now, there's the doctrine of the Trinity, of course, held there. The old Bodochs used to say, if you want to see the Trinity in action, go to Jordan. Go to the baptism of Jesus at the River Jordan, where the Father speaks from heaven. The Son is being baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove upon him. But then the Catechism tells us later on, in question 22, and it, the question is, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? And the answer is given. Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. Being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her, yet without sin. Now, when you try to get your head around that, there are things there that none of us understand. How? How was Christ born of the Virgin Mary? How was he conceived by the Holy Spirit? And as I think I may have said before, this is where faith comes in. You cannot understand everything in theology by, by, uh, or Christology for that matter. You cannot understand it by human reason or by human logic. There are things which are impossible for us to understand. And yet we believe them. That is where your faith comes in. If we understood everything in Scripture, then you wouldn't need faith. It's faith that helps you to believe the things that you don't understand. And so we come back to this particular question. My father and I are one. And it's interesting that the word one in the Greek there is actually neuter. It's not masculine or feminine, it's neuter. And it's indicating (coughs) that there is a difference of persons. But the difference is not, uh, it's in their essence. What the theologians call the essence of the Godhead. And if you try and understand the essence in this way, it's perhaps the simplest way of understanding it. You and I, our body and soul. And yet, none of us have ever seen our soul. None of us know where our soul is located. And the soul and the spirit, the same thing. I'm leaving these questions with you for you to think about a little bit. Where is your spirit? Is it in the mind? Is it in the heart? Etc. We used to think, it used to be thought that it was all in the heart. But yet we know that the heart is nothing other than a muscle that pumps blood. And so eventually over a period of time, of course, we talk about the heart as the seat of emotions. And yet that was a concept that came from Greek medicine because the Greeks believed that it was uh, in the heart that all the various bodily fluids came together to take the emotions round the body. Where is your soul? Do you believe this morning that you have a soul, a reasonable soul? It's amazing to think that the Lord Jesus Christ had a soul just in the same way as you and I have. That's what our catechism says. Christ, the Son of Man, became uh, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. And yet, no doctor, no psychiatrist, no surgeon can tell you where your soul is. He can cut you up into as many little pieces as he likes. He can scan you with every tool we have nowadays, but he won't find your soul anywhere. Where is it? Isn't that one of the amazing things that by faith Scripture tells us that we know that we have a soul and that that is the part that remains eternal. That we're told that uh, on our deaths the soul immediately of believers are united to Christ. And therefore it was necessary for him also to have a reasonable soul. Now, perhaps you're thinking this morning, this is pretty heavy stuff. How do we understand this? Well, try and think of it this way. I'll give you another example that might help. You are all familiar with fire. And yet if I said to you, if I had a fire here in the middle of the church, I see horrible, horrified looks on the faces of some, if 
But supposing a church was on fire and I said to you, put your hand in the fire, you would immediately say no. Why not? Because I would get burnt. And you've suddenly realized that you know a property of fire that you cannot see. You can feel it, but you can't see it. If we were in darkness, you would see another property of fire that we don't see in the daylight, or to a lesser degree. The fire gives forth light. And yet, the fire has not changed in the slightest. It is still fire, but it possesses other elements. It's a little bit like the diamond and the piece of coal. I'm sure you're familiar with for all of these ladies who are so uh, keen on having diamonds on their finger that all you're wearing uh, on your finger is simply a compressed lump of coal. I don't know if you knew that. Maybe I've destroyed your romantic notions now. But it's the same carbon that's included in it. Diamonds and coal are simply carbon atoms reformed, reshaped. And yet, if I asked you to wear a lump of coal on your finger, I'm sure I would get uh, a mouthful in return. Now, when you take these analogies and you try and think and apply them to I and the Father are one, it should then become easier for us to see that the person of Christ is a separate entity in his humanity, as a human being. There are many who say that Christ wasn't a proper human being, that he was created, some religions maintain he was created much later. When God's plan was put into disarray in the Garden of Eden by Satan, what nonsense. The only Son begotten of the Father. He was eternal in heaven before anything was created. And we're told later on in Scripture that He was the author of creation. All creation was a triune act by the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together. You see that in Genesis 1. The Spirit fluttering or moving on top of the water. Let us make. And so we come to this concept. What then of God is present in the humanity of Christ? That's a very interesting question. Dr. John Owen, the 16th century uh, <coughs> Puritan writer, spends a whole chapter debating that question. And so do other eminent theologians. This is what William Shedd says, an American theologian. He says, what is common to all three persons is the essence of the God." the essence of the Godhead. Now, you may well be familiar with the word essence when you come simply to dealing with something like vanilla essence in your cooking or something like that. And you know that it's an extract that is taken from the vanilla pod or the vanilla bean and then sort of uh, squeezed down and compressed to form the essential part of and the essence of the Trinity are all the attributes of the Godhead. That's why we use the term Godhead. They never lose any of their properties. They are reciprocal properties. It's another word that the theologians use. That is, properties that go backwards and forwards to each other all the time. The commonest one that we speak of is reciprocal love. 
the love that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Never increasing, because it cannot increase any more than it is. Never decreasing, but constantly flowing from one to the other. Isn't this what Jesus says quite often? The Father loves the Son. And in the same way, the Son loves the Father because he is obedient to him. And that is what you and I find so difficult. As we remember Jesus' commandment, and I mentioned already, if you love me, keep my commandments. And many of us will say, yes, Lord, I do love you. But I find it so difficult to keep your commandments. So difficult to keep them. Indeed, Scripture tells us that we sin daily in thought, word, and deed. And therefore, that is why we need the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was the only one without sin who could who could go to the cross at Calvary and bear the wrath of God. God's perfect sacrifice in perfect obedience to the Father's will. Why? So that you and I could be cleansed by the blood that cleanses from all sin. That is how he becomes the mediator, because he assumes a human body. He couldn't have done it without leaving the Godhead. That's what we speak about as the humiliation of Christ, coming and taking human form. And it's quite amazing, I know time has gone by, but if you think for a minute or two about the, what the humiliation of Christ actually is, Imagine someone who is, even someone is in itself a misleading concept, who is eternal. With all the glory of eternity around him, worshipped by the angels, loved by the Father. And he leaves all that behind to be born as a child, to live for 33 years in a world surrounded by sin. Have you ever thought of that? How difficult it must have been for the Lord Jesus Christ to be surrounded by sin on all sides ever since he was able perhaps to walk, to talk or later on. In his divine nature, he would, have been, he would have been conscious of it all the time. But in his human nature, he wouldn't become conscious later, until later on, as he grows up. And do you remember that scripture tells us that he grew in favor with God and man. He grew in stature and favor with God and man. But constantly surrounded by sin. must have been so difficult for him. There must have been times when he felt that his righteous anger should have lashed forth against the things that he was seeing going on round about him. But yet he only does it in the cleansing of the temple. My father's house is a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. And then of course the greater humiliation of being crucified. And there are so many things that come in together with all that. As we start to tie all that together, we see the divinity of Christ working even on the cross. Even on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. I'm quite sure, and God forbid that it would ever happen, but I'm quite sure that if you and I were being crucified, 
the last thing we would have on our minds would be to forgive those who were carrying out the action. But that's the first saying from the cross. Of the seven sayings, that's the first saying. And there are so many other things. When we come to consider, I and the Father are one. The Jews didn't understand it. Even his disciples at this stage probably didn't understand it either. And I wonder how much you and I understand of it this morning. But it was necessary for him to be one. Because otherwise he could not have become the mediator between God and man. He had to take on a human soul and a human body to be the mediator, now sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding for his people. That's an amazing thought as well when you think about it. That the Son of God, resurrected, ascended, now on the right hand of the Father, is interceding as mediator for you and I this morning. For those who are believers, you are, I'm sure, familiar with that picture. You know that you have the Holy Spirit in you, helping you, and also interceding for you. But how often do you think of the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, sitting on the right hand? And remember again, that's simply a figure of speech showing that he is in the position of power beside the Father, interceding for you this morning, that you will be kept from the wickedness of Satan and his angels, that you will be kept from the wickedness of the world, that God's restraining grace, how often do we think of God's restraining grace, will keep you out of danger and out of difficulties. Just think of the number of things that could have gone wrong this morning before you made it to church. You could have been electrocuted in boiling the kettle this morning. You could have had a car accident on the way here. It might have been a minor earthquake and the church in Crosobust collapses on top of us, etc., etc., etc. And when you start thinking of the number of things that we take for granted every single day, you take it for granted that the sun will rise again tomorrow. There will come a day when it won't. But that's a different thing altogether. <coughs> But the Lord Jesus Christ is acting as mediator on your behalf on the right hand of the Father. And he can only do this because he has the full essence of the Godhead. And in doing so, he was then able with the Father to send out the Holy Spirit. That's what you see on the day of Pentecost. That the Holy Spirit is then poured out wasn't that it wasn't there before. You see it in the Old Testament as well. But in the Old Testament it sort of comes and goes. And it's not pulled out in its fullness until the day of Pentecost. And that is what the work of the cross has done. That is what the work of the Lord Jesus Christ has done. It's enabled the mediation, the intercession, but also the Holy Spirit to be present in your heart if you are a believer in them. And when you consider all these things, what a wonderful plan God had <coughs> from all eternity. And when we use the God, God there, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It wasn't suddenly that the father was there and thought, oh, good idea to have a son and make this plan, etc. No. All three persons of the Godhead existed from all eternity. 
That is why in the Shema, what's known as the Shema, the prayer that was taught to Israel in the wilderness in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, not three gods, one God. The Lord our God is one God. And so you find from the very beginning that the idea of Messiah coming is there in the Old It's 39 times mentioned in the Old Testament that Christ would come, that the Messiah would come. And remember, again, if you're confused by the two terms, Christ, Christos, is simply the Greek term. Messiah is the Old Testament Hebrew term. They both mean the anointed one. They mean exactly the same thing. The Messiah of the Old Testament, the Christ of the New Testament, are one and the same. And if you go back in the Old Testament and look at the Theophanies, there's maybe another big word for you this morning. Theos, Greek word for God. The Theophanies, the appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Then you will find that there are a large number of Perhaps the one best known to us is when he appears to Joshua as the commander of the Lord's army. But he's also there with Lot walking towards Sodom. The three angels, four angels at first, and then it becomes three. Have a look and see. And you will find other ones. When Manoah and his wife were sacrificing and the angels, they didn't know it was an angel, the angel goes up in the fire of the sacrifice. It's there from the very beginning. And when you bring all that together and you come to the cross at Calvary, how can you not see the beauty of what God has done for you? How can you not see the wonder of the divine plan? And how can you not see the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross at Calvary so that you and I might understand this mystery at least, perhaps not fully, perhaps we shall never understand it fully, even in heaven, but at least not only do we begin to see it, but we believe it by faith. And perhaps that's the question for you this morning to take with you. My Father and I are one. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning? And if you don't, I don't need to tell you what the result of that will be. He is calling, he is saying, he is begging you to come to him. Come to him this morning. And even although you don't understand everything, and none of us understand everything, nevertheless, you can come by faith to believe on him as your Savior, as your Lord and Master. May the Lord bless these thoughts to us this morning. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can meditate on these things, the deep things of Scripture. We thank you that we understand very clearly uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ says, the work that he carried out, that no one else could do it, that he was the one who would be given as the atonement for our sin. And we thank you for that. Help us, O Lord, to come to faith this morning, to come to you in faith, and to acknowledge you as Lord and Master, and to see the beauty of the risen Saviour. Be with us then as we conclude our morning worship and pardon our sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing verses then in the conclusion in Psalm 139 on page 432. Psalm 139, we'll sing the verses marked 5 to 10, three verses, which give us again this uh, idea Behind, before thou hast beset, and laid on me thine hand, 
Such knowledge is too strange for me, too high to understand. Even the, even the psalmist had difficulty in understanding some of these things. From thy spirit, whither shall I go, or from thy presence fly? Ascend I heaven, lo, thou art there, there if in hell I lie. Take I the morning wings and dwell in utmost parts of sea. Even there, Lord, shall thy hand me lead, thy right hand hold shall me. Let us sing these verses into God's praise. Behind before thou hast be said. Behind, before thou hast be set, and laid on me thine hand, such knowledge is too strange for me to Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.